always ready. <laughs> you know me. Uh, one of those things is, if you let me start talking, I don't shut up. I just over there shaking it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. All right. So last week we had talked about hyper dispensationalism. Uh, I titled the message, you know, snakes slithering in, and. It had come about, as I told you, uh, had a, one of these individuals try to infiltrate into my Facebook page, uh, and you know he gave himself away pretty quickly uh, with his ultra fine hair splitting and false teachings in regards to salvation. You know, so I immediately kicked him to the curb because, uh, as I said, uh, with uh, with a lot of these people. I'm not even going to waste my time trying to convince them of their wrongness. They're already so entrenched in uh, their lies uh, that I just I, I'm going to out them for what they are. I'm going to reprove them, and that's it. You know, uh, I find myself more and more standing with Paul with his statement of "Let the ignorant be ignorant." Uh, you know, when you've got people, you know, because I'm not going to argue with somebody over obvious truth. You know, and then when you've got somebody who is open to listening and learning, that's a different thing. But, you know, this fella, he's, you know, my age at least, he, he's been pastoring for a great number of years. He, you know, no, no, take, take your lies and go somewhere else. Now, I begin talking about three of their lies that the hyper-dispensationalists push. One is that the body of Jesus Christ, the church, did not begin until after Acts 28. We addressed that. Uh, that water baptism is not for the church, but only for Israel, and that the Lord's Supper is not for for the church either. Well, we're having Lord's Supper next Sunday, so, oh well. <laughs> now, again, I say that their goal, for whatever insane reason, satanic reason, is to eliminate Bible-believing Baptist churches. Uh, their number one big hang-up is water baptism. I mean, that is, they just... They, they can't get off of this subject. And everything else in their, their twisted theology is all governed by their attempt to try to get rid of water baptism as being a legitimate ordinance for the church. You know, And so that when they're carving up the Bible, as they do, you know, that is the main goal of what they're trying to do is to eliminate it at all costs which includes you know as all heretics will do taking scripture out of their context to try to prove their lie uh, and ignoring uh, the context of the scripture and multiple scriptures that you you know that when you compare scripture with scripture that are the proofs of doctrine as provided by the Lord you know, they are going to tell you that, you know, you can only take doctrine for the church out of three of Paul's epistles, the, the uh, prison epistles, which would be Ephesians, Philippians, and, and, and Colossians, you know, which is because in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, there's nothing in there about baptism or the Lord's Supper, <laughs> see? So that's why they eliminate the other one. Uh, you know, and because Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were written after what's recorded in Acts 28. Now, these vipers in general, the churches that they are, they belong, that they found are either part of the Grace Gospel Fellowship or of the Berean Bible Society. Uh, but you're going to find them quite often in and amongst the membership of Bible-believing Baptist churches, and they're there as infiltrators. Okay, 
uh, your Jehovah's Witnesses do the same type of thing. Uh, some other groups will do the same type of thing, send people in to infiltrate uh, and to, as Paul says, spy out our liberty in the Lord and attempt to introduce these false doctrines. They are not honest, earnest soul winners at all. Where do they get their membership from? They steal them. They cut the herd. Okay, they don't go out soul winning. They don't try to breach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not how they build their churches. They rob churches of the immature and the ungrounded, which is why I put so much effort and emphasis on exposing them so that uh, you, know, you can't get caught by them. Now, we had clearly established last week that the Church of Jesus Christ was established well before Acts 20. In fact, it was established with the original 11 apostles, and Judas, after Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we'll look at a few references here real quick. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Of course, they don't like these references. Uh, Matthew 28, 16, to the end of the chapter. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when he saw them, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach. All nations, okay, not just the Jews, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And again, in the name, not names, the name, the singular name, the singular name for the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost is the Lord. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Uh, you have the same thing in Mark 16, in uh, verses 14 through 20. Uh, similarly, also Luke 24, 44 through 53. In John, we would be in John 17, the true Lord's Prayer, where the Lord is actually praying. And I want to read that. John 17. I'm going to read the whole chapter here for you. And listen to what Christ has to say here. Now, he's, he's with the disciples. And this is prior to his crucifixion. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And okay, well, one of the things he gave him to do was to establish the church. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, okay? the church of called out assembly, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Okay, so if the apostles are one with Jesus Christ, okay, that's the body. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, 
Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Here's the kicker. Neither pray, pray I for these alone. So we're not just talking about the Jewish disciples. Okay. okay. Neither pray I for these alone. Okay. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. There's the Gentile church. That they all may be one. So you can't say that, you know, <laughs> prior to, and they back themselves up all through Acts because they keep getting caught by the scripture, <laughs> you know, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And so here we have one of the great passages that proves quite clearly the fact that the body of Jesus Christ begins with the 11. Go to John 20 now with me. Here we're looking at verse 29, 30, 31. Last three verses in that chapter. Christ is risen. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So that's written... Again, for everybody, not just, you know, whosoever will. Uh, next chapter, 21 and verse 7. Here we are. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Oh, 17 is what I want, not 7. I'm sorry. Uh, and he saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. There's the commandment that he's giving to, you know, pastors, leadership within the church. And he gives it to who? For Peter. Okay, one of the eleven. Uh, and then, of course, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. 
of the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, now again, John's baptism, okay, was for what? The nation of Israel. John's baptism was a baptism, uh, you know, for the remittance of sin. God was preparing the nation of Israel to receive their Messiah. And he said, yeah, John baptized you with water for that. Okay, You're going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, A spiritual baptism to endue you with power to carry out the work of the church. Okay? And when they, they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Okay, they, okay, they were part of the church without knowing they were part of the church. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. The commitment... Or excuse me, the commission for them is to go out to the uttermost parts of the earth with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just to the Jew. Now we have discussed how they had to change, these hyper-dispensationalists, their position on when the church began as they tried to get rid of baptism. Uh... You know, they say, well, the only baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, that's a spiritual baptism. There is a water baptism, and it, and it exists for a reason. But every time they got caught, you know, taking, we did that last week, went through the scriptures and showed, no, well, here, prior to Acts 28, we've got this, this, and this. All the way back we go. You know, so that uh, through the decades, they have had to keep changing their position because they're being caught in their lie by the scriptures themselves, which is why it's so important to know the scriptures. And you've got to know that so that you can't be lied to. Now we're going to go on and we're going to address uh, this evening both water baptism and the Lord's Supper as ordinances of the Church of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now with the Church of Jesus Christ beginning with whom it did, and when it did, okay, uh, the, you know, we have the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, we have then, with that, been able to firmly establish some things here. Number one, the church is not merely an organization, okay, it is a living organism, okay? the body of Jesus Christ, he being its Head, and we being the individual members of that body, he being enthroned in heaven, we being still here on the earth, uh, uh, still utilizing our mortal flesh to carry out the will of God here on earth. We establish the fact that the Apostle Paul was called out for a distinct duty as the Apostle to the Gentiles. Okay? That is his. That was his specific duty: is to lead the missionary work of carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ out to the Gentile world. Now, God used Peter first uh, in that, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But He used Peter first in that for purpose and reason in that. 
Therefore, with Paul being called out, with that we establish the fact that Paul has been given the seven mysteries of the church, which are the essential doctrine for the believers during the church age. Okay? And those seven mysteries are found throughout his epistles, not just the three prison epistles. Uh, and because this was accomplished long before Paul ever even wrote his first epistle uh, in there, therefore all of the epistles of the Apostle Paul contain legitimate doctrine for the church of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, not just those three prison epistles. Now again, we can take comparing scripture to scripture and take scripture from other New Testament books and as long as it lines up with the mysteries that were given to Paul and what Paul teaches, fine, we can do that. Where it doesn't, we leave it alone. It's not intended for us. Now with the establishment of these facts, now you can begin to properly address both water baptism as well as the Lord's Supper as legitimate ordinances for the church. Okay? And that's important that that groundwork there is laid. Now we know, you know that the book of Acts, and we spent a good amount of time several months ago studying through the book of Acts, uh, that it is a transitional book that we watch the church grow and we see uh, the fact that that you know again hyper dispensationalists will say until God reveals something it can't exist so until the seven mysteries were revealed the church couldn't exist well go ahead and call Jesus Christ a liar if you want him okay I'm not going to uh, they received them they learned them uh, they transitioned from the work that Christ had been doing before his death, burial, and resurrection of offering himself as the Messiah corporately to the nation of Israel to offering salvation by grace through faith and his finished work to the individual where no longer does it matter if one is a Jew or a Gentile. Salvation comes to the individual by the exercising of their faith. Uh, we have, like I say, covered this very thoroughly. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to try to go back through all of that again tonight. Uh, but suffice it to say that the doctrine for the church okay, is very conclusively settled uh, by the time you're coming to Acts chapter 15. Okay, remember in Acts chapter 15, uh, you've already had uh, Jewish believers going out behind Paul, going into the churches that he's established and telling them that they've got to keep the law and that they've got to do this and they've got to do that, you know, which is contrary to what Paul has taught them and what Paul has revealed to them. And Paul finds out and they're butting heads with each other, so they decide to go up to Jerusalem to the elders of the church, the original 11, and say, okay, this is, you know, what the issue is here, to have that settled there, which it is settled there conclusively that what Paul has been preaching is the truth. And, of course, he's been doing this from Acts 9, you know, uh, Acts 11, somewhere in there is when he receives the mysteries, and then he's been preaching that all along. You know? And as I mentioned a little bit ago, Peter stands up in that council there in Acts 15 and says, look, God chose to reach out to the Gentiles first using me. Okay. And... You know, he's up there preaching. He's getting ready to preach, you know, the remittance, you know, the baptism of remittance, and the Holy Spirit cuts him off. And the, the Holy Spirit comes on these Gentiles who are now believing 
in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, and they start, start, start speaking. Yeah, I was just speaking in tongues myself. Uh, speaking in tongues, which, of course, tongues is a sign gift, and it's a for signs for. Signs are for the Jews. Okay, so it's a sign for Peter and for the Jews that are there with him that God is the one whose hand is at work here. You know, and then he goes on and says, well, who was I to resist God? And he solidifies that what Paul is preaching is true. In fact, if we go over to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom, wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Here you have the Apostle Paul confessing the fact that, or excuse me, Peter, that Apostle Paul's epistles are scripture that they are the divinely inspired words of God. Don't hear any Catholic priest teaching that coming out of the, you know, the first pope's mouth. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what he's saying here. You know, he's saying that those who are unlearned and unstable rest with it, which is exactly what we have going on with hyper dispensationalism here. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So what are we going to find about baptism, water baptism, believer's baptism, in the Pauline epistles? Well, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Now this I say, Listen carefully to the wording here. That every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Because this is one of the texts that they go to to prove their point. Okay, Talk about taking stuff out of context. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. So he did baptize lest any should say that I have baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not, and this is the verse they use, to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And they say, oh, here, Paul's telling you that baptism is not, that's not what he said. Okay, keep it in the context. Okay, what's the context here? You've got sectarianism going on here. You know, well, I'm right because you know, I know, I am a Paul. I follow Paul. Well, no, I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. I follow. You know, you know. This is what the context is. What's going on here? And he says, you know, you know, were you baptized in my name? No, you were baptized in the name of the Lord the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so what he's doing here is he's unbraining them here for their sectarianism. He is not saying that baptism is not a legitimate ordinance for the New Testament church. Okay? Christ didn't send me to baptize, he says. Christ didn't send me to baptize. He didn't send you to baptize. Okay? You can get saved, never get baptized, and you're still going to go to heaven. Look at the thief on the cross. Okay. Baptism is a pictorial ordinance that illustrates what occurs at the point of salvation in the believer. And it is commanded by the Lord.